us everyone welcome to the charvak podcast this is your host kushal mehra uh, sorry about the little bit of a confusion on the timing uh, haris's stream was uh, scheduled for 4:30 and why yeah no when there are different time zones we're dealing with of course yeah, yeah. it always ends up happening unfortunately sorry about that yeah, uh, yeah. yeah so so that was a little bit of a confusion but uh, uh, we are here and we we are now live and uh, today's topic is going to be titled islamism in the west and uh, just to give you guys a brief background about why i decided uh, along with haris to host this discussion on both my channel and his channel so haris and i we tend to experiment mm-hmm. with this thing right we when whenever we have a podcast even when i think of a podcast haris and i we post it on both our channels because haris has a slightly left of center leaning viewership i have a slightly right of center leaning viewership and i believe uh, and and uh, it's 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 very interesting that he, Haris is on the same view, you know, length uh, 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 point of view in that sense that uh, we should have an exchange of ideas where both the sides, you know, both audiences benefit from discussions and maybe you know sometimes I might be wrong, sometimes Haris might be wrong, and, no, and never, and we, I'm never wrong. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I'm joking of course. <laughs> so that this way we kind of improve ourselves, we improve each other and and our audiences also benefit. So as you guys know today's discussion is going to be called Islamism in the West. So why did I think of doing this discussion just to give you a brief background? As you guys know since October 7th there is a new uh, war that has engulfed the world that is the Israel Hamas conflict and post that conflict Israel uh, obviously has entered Gaza now there is a ground invasion happening in Gaza too and there have been a spate of protests around the western world and today's focus is going to be about a certain element uh, i want to make this crystal clear i am not stating that each and every protest or every single aspect of this protest has islamist tendencies but while we are looking at these protests we do see islamist tendencies we see very dangerous signs cutting across the western world whether it's canada america the united kingdom australia uh, i and haris correct me um, if i'm wrong in australia there was a video right outside the sydney opera where islamists were chanting gas the jews or am i wrong no no you're 100% right yeah few people were arrested too but most likely it was just a slap on the wrist okay so that that's exactly what the case is and when all of this was happening i thought i think it's only ap- appropriate that haris and i get together and we start talking about this and now that i have said enough so haris welcome thank you for coming well thank you thank you for having me and first of all i want to start with saying that what you i could see some of the comments on my channel i don't know whether you can highlight them or not regarding you and i want to say that this is how polarized our world is and how judgmental we have become that we love to live in our echo chambers you have been accused of being a far right wing hindu bigot or something anti islamist or something but it's funny that you said to me when we decided to have this podcast or this conversation you told me haris please make sure i don't want to target muslims i want to discuss the the ideology of islamism despite the fact that a lot of good well meaning people like yourself who are careful of words and the conversations that we have and what kind of an impact it's going to have on other people despite all of that people are still so judgmental that they cannot think outside of the box now obviously i the, the other thing i want to talk about is obviously the the west is basically and i think most of our conversation is going to focus around the fact that this political correctness that we've had um has become the west achilles heel um so many things that we want to say we don't say because we're worried we might offend some people even those we might need to have those honest conversations to solve or or to combat some ideologies that are literally medieval ideologies um i i i want i want to start with this actually before i go into that i want i want to talk about i want to differentiate two things there are palestinians who obviously happen to be muslims and we cannot ignore the fact that this conflict is beyond just political or about this holy land as we speak is holy for both of them 
but uh, or, or just land in general. This is at its heart a religious conflict that has been going on for centuries, and unfortunately, at the base of it, it's religion. So it's in, it's interesting, and you coming from Indian background, but obviously both of us are Indians. I am. I happen to be on the other side. We were separated in 1947. Isn't that ironic that Muslims had no problem in accepting the British decision to separate India on the basis of religion, but at the same time, around the same time, in another part of the world, a similar decision was made, but this time not in favor of Muslims, but in favor of Jews, they said, we, we don't accept that. Now, let me lay it out as simply as I can. Jews of the 30s and the 20s, and obviously we had a history of pogroms, and you can, you can go as far back as uh, the Roman times. We had, J Jews have been, uh, you know, they've been, they, they, they've been living under other people's rules. They haven't had their own government. They have no, they had no self-autonomy. And then obviously they had been living like refugees in uh, scattered all around the world. And then when an opportunity came after the, after the end of the first world war, Palestine or Israel or whatever you want to call it, that part of the land that fell in the hands of British and the British said, uh, oh, sorry. And the Jews said to British, uh, to the British, that we no longer want to live under an Islamic rule as we have been living for the past thousand years, and briefly by, uh, under Christians, and then before that, that was Muslims too, predominantly under, under, under uh, the Islamic caliphate. We no longer want to live under them. We want to have our own nation. This is exactly, in other, in, in other words, this is called the Dokomi Nazria, two-nation two theory, on the basis of which India was separated. Uh, India was carved into two pieces. Um, and can you blame the Jews that we don't want to live under, um, uh, under a Muslim rule? Can you blame them? Just like Muslims didn't want to live under, um, uh, under Hindu rule, they didn't want to live under them, even though the Hindu leaders of the time had assured them that this is not going to be a Hindu state. It's going to be a secular state. The founding fathers of India made sure or, or gave guarantees that it's going to be a secular state. And to be fair, India has lived up to those promises. To date, India is still a secular democracy. So, um, sorry, I want to wrap that up with the point that... Sorry. Um, that um, the two types of Muslims in this, obviously they're Palestinians, their grievances are real, they're genuine. I think the Palestinian people deserve to, um, uh, to have an independent state where they can create their own style of government, even though I know that that kind of a government is not in line with the way of government that I would want to see. It wouldn't be a secular liberal democracy. It won't be. Um, but they have a right to independence. So their grievances are genuine. But then there's another group of Muslims who are scattered all around the world, not just in the Muslim world, but also living in the West. And obviously we're going to be focusing on that and we're going to be talking a lot about them. They basically see that as a religious issue. I have made this argument over and over again. They're not interested in Muslim lives because at the same time, far more numerous Muslims have been killed in other parts of the world, and Muslims have not shown any interest in that. You haven't seen million march protests, million people protests in London or, or, or in Canada or in America or in Australia. You haven't seen them. Because at the base of it, at the heart of it, it is a religious issue. And when Jews say that this is anti-Semitism, or if you, more appropriately, if you want to uh, call them anti-Jewish, that's what it is at the heart of it. It is a religious conflict. Muslims see that as this land belonging to them. They are, it's an Islamic eschatology that in the end times, there would be a Jew hiding behind uh, trees or rocks or stones, and those stones and trees would tell, hey, Muslim, there's a Jew hiding behind me. 
So go and come and kill it. This is a very famous hadith, and I hope everyone knows about this now. This is Sahih Bukhari. It's a Sahih hadith. There's no Muslim, no genuine Muslim can deny that hadith, and they genuinely believe in that. And this is the reason, Kushal, this is absolutely the reason why every time Hamas carries out a, an, an idiotic attack against Israeli civilians, knowing full well that they're going to come back hard at them, and as a result, a lot of Palestinian civilians are going to die. And by the way, all the, the rest of the Muslims say that, oh, you stay there, fight for the Holy Land. Uh, let's live up to our uh, Islamic fantasy of end times when we'll be killing Jews. They are happy. Muslims all around the world, Lipstick Muslims, moderate Muslims, radical Muslims, all of them, they celebrate that. Um, and then when, when Israel responds, then they realize, as we're seeing right now, that Hamas is literally teetering and begging for a ceasefire. And I believe there's been a truce called. I think it's just going to be a little pause. It's not going to be a ceasefire because Benjamin Netanyahu, who, by the way, I'm not I'm not his fan at all. He has said that the war will continue. And Hamas is basically just trying to buy some time so they can release some hostages in drips and drabs. And then they're going to say, well, OK, they, that's going to give them enough time to break Israel's momentum. And then also it's going to give Hamas some time to regroup and re-attack on them. So the behavior of Palestinians can be understood and can be forgiven. I'm talking about Palestinian civilians, obviously not Hamas. Their grievances are real in the West Bank. I've always been against Israeli settlements in the West Bank. I think that's disingenuous, that's disgusting, and that should be condemned. And that lays the ground for... Hamas to recruit more people. But the Muslim diaspora living all around the world, they're disingenuous, they're, they are uninterested in, uh, in in Palestinian lives, they're more interested in the in living up to their religious fantasy, and their behavior is disgusting, and that's the one, that's what we should focus on, and that's what we probably would be focusing on. I have a follow-up to this, but before I ask the follow-up, I just want to back you up. So India Today has just reported this today. It's a mainstream Indian channel and news portal. So, I mean, if people are asking. Israel approves deal for release of 50 hostages. Hamas welcomes, court humanitarian truce. An Israeli government official told reporters on Tuesday that the agreement could help secure the release of 50 Israelis, mostly women and children, in groups of 12 to 13 per day. So this is what Harris was talking about. But I want to... It's okay. We can have another uh, follow-up on this. Uh, you spoke about this being a religious conflict. Now, a, a, a lot of people, including some YouTubers in Pakistan, podcasters in Pakistan, are very adamant that this is a colonialism issue. You have to look at it from the lens of colonialism. And it is uh, uh, nothing else. And it religion has nothing to do with it. They're very categorical when they say religion has nothing to do with it. Now, both you and I are disbelievers, albeit of slightly different varieties. But I absolutely am on board with you that this is a religious mm -hmm. issue. And religion is at the core of it. Not just from the Islamic end, but even from the Jewish end. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, we have fanatic Jews uh, who, who believe that this is a, a promised land. And obviously, you and I, us being atheists, and we can't, if we don't believe in a God, and then certainly we can't believe that uh, that an unknown entity, unproven entity, can uh, can sign you a piece of land unconditionally, um, or it gives you a license to just go and wipe off everyone else just so you can live there. So obviously, that, that, that no. So... Uh, yeah, those people are just shallow thinkers. They have no idea. And this is obviously, this th this is the epidemic of the far left that we've seen, not only just in so these some liberal circles of Pakistan, by the way, they, they shouldn't even be called liberals. But anyway, they're just phony. They're idiots. But we see the far left of the West. This is a hip thing. This is a thing in fashion. Um, and the far left in the West, um, these blue-haired, snowflake, tree-hugging, suffering from this uh, pathological altruism these idiots don't actually understand anything they look at everything from the oppressed versus oppressor uh, uh, spectrum that's it they can't see beyond that um they would join these people who would chant from the river to the sea palestine will be free which is a genocidal slogan this ge this literally means wiping off israel either you go um, uh, either you leave this piece of land or you come and live under a, um, uh, under an Islamic rule or Palestinian rule. Um, and in the process, if you get killed, you get killed. This is a genocidal slogan. And nobody 
No sane person can allow that. The only pragmatic solution would be a two-state solution. Now you can you can blame both sides for it. I'm not going to get into it. I'm not going to I'm not going to be a party to either side. But to say that this is not a religious issue, this is a colonial issue. These people are absolute idiots and they're nothing about history because because 40 to 50 sorry 50 to 60 percent of Israeli Jews. About, some estimates suggest up to four and a half million, but it could be four million, as many at, at mm -hmm. least four million Jews are Mizrahi Jews who are Arab Jews. Crucial. These guys are native to the land. They were expelled in the forties by by Morocco, by Egypt, by Libya, uh, by uh, Syria, Lebanon, um, Yemen. These are Arab Jews. Where were, what were you? What were they meant to do with this? Um, so of course they, some people say that, okay, well, some radical Israelis, they did, they carried out so, or, or they forced these people to, to leave those countries and come here, whatever the truth may be. I mean, the truth is always somewhere in the middle, whatever the case may be, what do you want to do to, to them? This is a popular narrative that I believe for a very long time as well, because I was ignorant of the fact these people were told um, that these are white Europeans. Uh, Hitler went after them, and after them, who, 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 whatever the whatever was uh, uh, the leftover Jews came to Israel and they colonized the local area, which is obviously uh, nothing could be further from the truth. They, they, they make up the European Jews make up a minority of Israeli Jewish population, so it, it is nothing but a, um, a, a a religious issue from both sides, as, as you rightly said. Um, but uh, but now it is done. There is a concept called historical conservatism. We we have to conserve history. We cannot right the wrongs of the history. This is why I have I have often said that the just to speak in the Indian context as well. I I, I am at least consistent that knocking down mosques that were built on Hindu temples is not the right way to go about it because. If we start following that logic, then all the Europeans from Australia, Canada, America, and South America, all of them would have to go back to Europe. That The world doesn't work that way. What, what's done is done. We should always look towards the future. We should try, we, we should try our best to, to find means to coexist. All right. So let's now focus on anti-Semitism in the or anti uh, Islamism in the West, not anti-Semitism. It has this time showcased in the form of anti-Semitism, but it's at its core, it's a problem of Islamism. Now, there are different layers to Islamism in the West. One is in the form of average people uh, showcasing Islamist tendencies, um, where you have people carrying Islamist fags during protests. Uh, you have people making Islamist slogans uh, during these protests across the world. One of the prime examples of that was outside the Sydney Opera House. Somebody started shouting, gas the Jews. Now, uh, before people ask me what is an Islamist, well, political Islam is Islamism. If people did not know, wanting Islam as a part of a political system and imposing Islam as an ideology on everyone, and when your politics is governed through an Islamic lens, that's Islamism. And Islamism tends to showcase itself because it's very important to explain to people what, what we're talking about. And Islamism tends to showcase itself uh, in multiple ways. It's very different from average Muslims practicing their religion at a personal level by going to a mosque and congregating in a mosque. Islamism is when you try to impose those tendencies on the rest of the political culture. And that's what we're talking about, Islamism in the West. And now I want to start by a very unique case. Uh, did you follow the case of Rashid Ataleb? In yeah, the, I heard a little bit about America. it. Yeah, I, yeah, but I'd like you to explain it. Yeah, go for it. So Rashida Taleb basically is a Michigan Democrat. She was recently rebuked and censured. By the way, <laughs> you know, she has the unique uh, state where Privilege, she has yeah. been censured by the uh, the Congress, uh, U.S. Yeah. Congress. Yeah, and the U.S. So, so just to give everyone a context, I think in a 250 year almost history of the United States of America, only 24 times this censure has been used. And this woman is one of them now. So like uh, censures. Yeah, are but it's a badge of honor. But, but Muslims would see it as a badge of honor. So it's like once in 10 years this happens and this woman has managed to be a part of that. Now, what happened was that uh, she had posted a video uh, on Twitter 
that included a clip of protesters which was using the chants uh, from the river to the sea palestine will be free and uh, she was criticized for it but she did not apologize for it and uh, she said that uh, it doesn't matter i am going to go ahead and say it anyway and she doubled down on it and then mm. uh, she was censured in the house now does this qualify as islamism rashid atlaf yeah absolutely because as i said at the base of it so 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 you 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 correctly explain what islamism is one level above that is jihadism obviously jihadism yeah, is that is a strong that yeah that that literally arm um, struggle against uh, darul harb you know we 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 we're just going to turn that into an islamic state um by means of violence Uh, the next best thing is islamism that was in the charter of muslim brotherhood that we're going to make enough babies in these western countries that you know in, in 10 20 30 40 years we're going to have enough population in the west and i think we are at crossroads here where the west have to make some tough decisions they have to do it yeah. um and this conflict again like i'm generally an optimistic person and i and, and i hope that maybe some of the western leaders would have seen this whoa this is just a trailer what is to follow what we've seen they have shown no regard they have shown no loyalty to their host countries countries that have adopted them countries that have given them good life they have shown absolutely no regard for them no respect to them they have shown that i don't know if you followed uh, last saturday uh, actually a couple of saturdays um, ago where um, it was a remembrance day for britain and obviously second world the second world war is very important to um, to the british public and they uh, they, they didn't want anyone to get near their war memorial cenotaph and all, all of these things and they showed no interest in that they they that they have been desecrating these monuments they've been waving palestinian flags and they've been chanting from the river to the sea palestine will be free now again something that everyone needs to understand especially our indian audience that the indians and the middle easterns we don't carry the baggage of holocaust like the west does uh, we actually uh, you know uh, and you could probably explain that better than i can uh, uh, how 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 indians see winston churchill he caused a uh, a man made famine to uh, uh, to the people of bengal how many people died in that uh, did, are there any millions? estimates yeah a few, few million, million people and he said that oh well it's the fault it's the fault of the bengalis who breed like rabbits right so he he used that term for so he 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 didn't see us as humans he saw us as subhumans so we have our own grievances with the west i get it um uh, but the west knows what they did what 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 happened under their watch to the jewish people and jews have been very successful in letting the west know that this is what happened the holocaust happened on their watch 6 million jews lost their lives is the, the greatest catastrophe one of the greatest catastrophes of the 20th century because we have armenian genocide but 3 million mm -hmm. 2 million bengalis died nobody even knows about this Be, uh, directly not because of hitler's policy but because of churchill's policies mm -hmm. it happened because he wanted to feed his soldiers in the west how many indian soldiers died serving for the crown in the second world war i don't know quite a lot nobody don't get a mention so we have our own grievances with the west and and that's the reason why is and, and again this, that's just the indian aspect but also there's a the, there's a middle eastern aspect of that too they did not have a hand in the holocaust barring that Uh, the, the Grand Mufti of Jerusalem, whatever his name was, he obviously went to um, to Hitler and shook his hands and probably stayed there for a bit. And he he was complicit to some extent in the in, in the Holocaust, or at least in part. Um, but Muslims had their own battles to fight with all these countries: Syria, Lebanon, Iraq, Saudi Arabia. All these countries owe their existence to the West because the West defeated. the ottomans and as a result these countries came into existence um mm. so but at the end there was this palestinian conflict lingering there and as a result they were not thankful and instead they became antagonistic to the west so um and this is the reason why the muslim world actually pays no attention and this is the reason why 
they when like any society or any civilization they would just put their own own interests first and they look at this from the perspective of israelis jewish jews versus palestine muslims so they are agreement um, agreement party so therefore they come up with these um insensitive ideas um and they come up with these insensitive slogans uh like from the river to the sea palestine will be free and they don't see that as genocidal they don't you can try to explain them as much as you can. Even some of the ex-Muslims, they don't understand that. They actually, um, they actually downplay the slogan. I, I, I wanted to, because uh, I know we want to go into this Islamism, but, but I want to play this video to you. It's important sure. um, that this threat of Islamism, we are seeing these little snippets of it, as I said, it's just a trailer and it's going to get a lot worse. We have very powerful, charismatic, influential influencers, social media activists who are who are spreading the message and and it's they're not only just resonating with the the Muslim diaspora, second or third generation Muslim diaspora, but also with these bleeding heart leftists. Um, so ha have a listen to this statement by a uh, I think he's an Emirati minister. Have a listen to what he had to say. And he said it in 2015 or 16, I believe. But it, every Was word it is 2015 turning out to be or 12, 2012? I don't remember. I'm also confused okay. about the year. I think it says 2017, but let's just... Uh, I think okay. it's, uh, it's sure. saved as terrorism, sure. UAE foreign minister in 2017. And let me say this in... Oh, sorry. sorry you... I'll put it back. I'm saying. Yeah. Reverse it. Uh, and, and, and let me say this in English, so you can understand what I'm saying. I have translation. No, I know you have translation, but I'm, I just want to make sure you get it right. There will come a day that we will see far more radical extremists and terrorists coming out of Europe because of lack of decision-making, trying to be politically correct or assuming that they know the Middle East and they know Islam and they know the others far better than we do. Mm. And I'm, I'm sorry, but that's pure ignorance. And not only it's pure ignorance, but it is also pure arrogance. hubris, arrogance, exactly. And it's Western this arrogance. Is Exactly. And this is what's been happening, Kushal, for a very long time that we've been trying to warn the West about, and no attention has been paid. In fact, they've actually uh, regressed in their thinking. Instead of doing something about it, they've actually gone this way of appeasement, uh, Chamberlain's appe appeasement. This is what's happening in, um, in Australian mosques. Listen to this. Sure, I'll, I'll put it up. They don't love us. And they wish they can kill all of us. If the Australian government like it or not, if the ASIO likes it or not, if they want to deport me from Australia or not, the jihad is the solution for the Ummah. Muslims, so interested and so thrilled and looking forward to join the Mujahideen. Muslims, they starving for jihad. They, their hearts are aching for jihad. They keep saying, I mean, what has Australia done to these people? They keep saying that this is, these are political issues, these are political grievances. Then why do they invoke Islam? Why do they invoke them? Um, because at the end of it, I know Islam. I've written a book on that. Go and try it. Go, go Google Curse of God, Why I Left Islam. Um, I understand that. But anyone who actually ignores that, they're basically just sleepwalking into the sleepwalking their way into this death sentence. This is what we're seeing. It is becoming a norm and it's going to happen even more. Look at this what happened in Germany. Palestine. 
So it's not just Palestine. It's just not Palestinian issue. But of course, Palestinian issue, if it's just a political issue, then why, why, are, why is every Muslim united? Again, as I said, moderate or not, radical or not, they're all united. They don't see that from a lens of, okay, what's suitable, whether let's see who's the right party, let's try to be fair. They're not, they're not interested in that. They see that as a, a, as a part of their religious fantasy of killing Jews in end times. That's it. It's very simple. Every every Muslim knows it. Pakistani Muslims are slightly bit, bit, bit of an exception, but even Pakistani Muslims who don't share any border with Israel, Indonesian Muslim, Malaysian Muslim, they're all, they're, they're all uh, vouching for their fellow Muslims who have no cultural link with, with, with Palestinian Muslims. 300,000 Syrians died. Nobody made a peep. 250,000 Yemenis died. Nobody made a peep. All of a sudden, 10th, again, this is atrocious, it's horrible, and I think sometimes Israel goes overboard. And I condemn, I don't condemn the military action because it has to happen, but I think you, the only thing we can accuse Israel of is probably being, uh, probably not caring enough for the collateral damage. That's probably the most we can accuse Israel of, but Israel has a right to exist, and as a result, Israel has a right to defend itself. Um, but the biggest problem, Krishal, is is again the, the the biggest hurdle that we have are the bleeding heart leftist of the West. Look look at these people. Who are these people? They they're not your average Muslims. Yes, the, the the majority of these protesters are Muslim. This is a, in, another one from uh, Melbourne, I believe, from uh, from uh, from last week. Sorry, I need to remove this. Give me a sec. Um, look, look at this. You see, a lot of these Westerners, they're actually white Australians. They mm -hmm. only see it from the perspective of oppressed oppressor, colonial, we're university students, yay, we're the champions of freedom. These idiots don't realize what they're actually advocating for. Yes, standing up for Palestinian civilians, I can empathize with that, but none of these people condemn Hamas. None of these people do that. And I wonder, where does their humanity disappear when you talk about 1,200 Israeli innocent civilian elderly people, children, women, raped and murdered, beheaded? Where does their humanity go there? I just watched a Piers Morgan interview with, uh, with Andrew Tate. Same thing, same rhetoric over and over again. I, I, I get upset. I, I, I've stopped watching those Palestinian videos because, yeah, they're absolutely heartbreaking. You don't want to see those civilians and children dying because of Israeli bombs. You don't want to see that. But who is to be blamed for that? This attitude is to be blamed for that. These are the people. Look at these guys. So um, I think when we talk about the West, the West has to wake up like the, like the UAE minister said. This is ignorance. It's not just ignorance, as you said. It's, it's arrogance and it's Western hubris as well. And I think most of that comes from when the, the West got del delusioned after the Second World War's victory. They thought that, okay, because our Western, secular, democratic, liberal values are so good that wherever we go, where, however we export them, um, we're going to turn them into liberal democracies like us. That happened with Nazi Germany, yes. Germany became a beacon of a Western liberal democracy. And so did Imperial Japan on the other side of the world. Japan, if you want to say that, okay, well, they are uh, they're a civilization on their own, but they are a liberal democracy, Western-style democracy. Yes, well, I don't know about democracy. how liberal they are. I don't know about yeah, how yeah, liberal they are. Yeah, no, I'm, I'm, talk I'm talking about the constitution. I'm talking about the form of government. I get it. Like, uh, yeah, they, they are a cultural culture on their own. They're not Western per se. Um, Do they allow again, Muslims like uh, in their immigration policy? Well, they're, they're, they're starting to. They're starting to because they, their uh, birth rates are falling. And again, uh, there's another point I want to talk about. I'm sure you've read that book, Clash of Civilization. When did that come out? In 93 or 94? I think 92, yeah. 93. So, so if you read that, I read that again. If you read that, and even in Yaksharak at that time, they, all, all the Western leaders at that time were actually worried about changing demographics. They were worried about importing old people from other cultures, but they did nothing 
to um, to you know to to boost their fertility numbers. Or I know Australia tried, but again, we know it's it, you can't really blame any politician or any system for it. It's just whenever uh, there's prosperity, people tend to make less babies. So we understand that, but they could have done a lot more. I don't want to quote Tom, Tommy Robinson. I think he just made, recently made a video and said, well. Our birth rates are falling. Keep importing people from India because we don't have this problem of radical Islam coming from Indians. Even Indian Muslims are far less um, uh, Islamist in their approach than uh, some of these other Muslims that come from other parts of the world. Yeah, it's it, in England. It's a unique Pakistani problem. I don't know what the hell it is. But, but in France, is... you've got Algerian Muslims. You got Moroccan Muslims, uh, Moroccan Muslims in in Spain. Like it's it's a problem everywhere. They're, 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 it's not just one. People say, oh, it's only a Pakistani problem. It's only a you know a Bang Bangladeshi problem. No, they, they, they behave pretty much the same everywhere. In Germany, there's a lot of Turkish problem issue. Yeah, it is. Now I, I wanted to share uh, this news. Uh, this was uh, published in the Toronto Star on the sixth of November. Uh, 2023, and it, I mean, I don't understand what is wrong with people. So, this is the Toronto Star, it is an uh, oh, so this is CP24, but yeah, the news was first published in the Toronto Star, and basically, it was Jewish group speaks out after cafes targeted in pro Palestinian rallies. So, ba so just to give you guys a brief background, Aroma Cafes are Jewish-owned. I mean, they're an Israeli company, but the Canadian North American subsidiary is independent. It is independently owned. Yes, it's like a franchise model. So some might be owned by Jews, uh, as uh, mm -hmm. uh, as though that should be a problem. Like you can't, Jews can't own businesses now, apparently. And what happened was when these rallies were going out, um, you will see, uh, you know, people as it is reported in the article here it says video emerged over the weekend showing a group of pro palestinian protesters swarming in aroma cafe near the cn tower downtown and chanting quote boycott aroma the israeli founded coffee chain has branches all over canada and the us in one video people can be seen chanting shaking their fists and waving palestinian flags at the windows of the coffee shop another video appeared to show protesters praying spray painting graffiti on the windows of another aroma location as hundreds of protesters marched outside a similar scene unfolded with a pro palestinian protest at another jewish owned business on university avenue 2 weeks ago um what do you i mean what has a cafe got to do with the israel palestine protest it's just the same thing. You know, you know, another funny thing happened in Pakistan. Uh, the, the, this rumor was circulated that McDonald's is owned by Israel in Pakistan. Oh, you might have seen some of those videos. Uh, oh, Ronald, Ronald McDonald was apparently a Jew. It, it, it doesn't get... Mac, McDonald doesn't get any oh, more yeah. Ronald McDonald got a Punjabi chitral. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so, so, so somebody shared this photo of mcdonald's where because you know like these th th these kind of uh what do you call it when, when these people go and ransack and they burn the building down to the ground uh where, where, what is it called vandalism or whatever you want to call it yeah um it happens a lot in pakistan and then they wonder why there's no foreign direct investment coming in because you know they see sometimes they see a barcode on coca-cola that looks like muhammad in arabic and then they attack a van carrying Coca-Cola um, soft drinks. So that's the kind of people we're dealing with. Um, so the, so this McDonald's owner actually wrote La 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 Muhammad Rasulullah at the front, big bold letters, just to say that McDonald's is Muslim. Don't come and attack my building. And of course, the, uh, McDonald's is a franchise and uh, a local Muslim would own it. And obviously he'd be making money out of it. He'd be paying a small percentage to uh, the McDonald um, Corporation. Uh, so I don't know. Maybe there must have been a rumor that Aroma, this cafe, is probably uh, owned by a Jew. This, this no, it Jewish... is Israeli owned. The parent company is oh, yeah. Israeli owned. Yeah, so so this is it. So this is it. Now, now you know, this is the Jewish owned and uh, we, you, you got to go for it. It's a it's legitimate target, so and then these why people... do they then why do they use Facebook? Whoa, that is also Jewish owned. Somebody made a joke. Somebody said that uh, we're only. They said that we're going to keep using them, 
It's, it's, these are beliefs of convenience, of course. I mean, obviously, this is ridiculous. We're going to keep using Israeli products so we improve our lives, and that would be the ultimate uh, injury that would, we would cause to Israel by taking benefit from their products because they view us as enemies. <laughs> you, can, you, can, you can create anything. You can create any kind of justi justification to satisfy your hatred or to satisfy, at the same time, maintaining your convenience. Um, so, yeah, I mean, it's just... Th 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 this is... Come on, Kushal. This is, this is nothing new or unique no. the, uh, th th there, was, there, there was this there was this video at the start of this conflict that went viral i think imam tahidi shared that where this woman was saying let's boycott she named all, all of these western corporations and one of them was obviously nike as well and then they zoomed in and on um, and to her feet and uh her, her sneakers were nike sneakers, <laughs> she was wearing nike sneakers herself. so um th th i mean these guys you know, are a, a, a sample of this was shared in my country india so this was an al jazeera report i'm not going to play the video because they'll strike me for copyright but basically this is a muslim shop owner in india who is no longer selling israeli and u.s products to show support to palestinians in gaza so this 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 exactly his name is Mohammad Nadim. Um, uh, he says his income yeah, will decrease so. a bit, but we can't really fight them. But we can boycott their economies. So he's going to do that now. He is one of the many shop owners in India taking part of the boycott. Of products like Pepsi and Coca Cola are no longer stocked in his shop. I'm reading the the literal words of the of the uh, you know Al Jazeera video. The boycott has started a movement in this Muslim neighborhood. A number of families here say they are also boycotting these products. Um, now my question over here is that what if this was flipped around, and what if somebody would say? I'm going to boycott Muslim businesses in, in Canada, in America, in Australia, in New Zealand. Uh, I'm, I'm not for it before somebody thinks. I'm saying, what if it is done? Uh, mm. th these are the first people who are going to cry Islamophobia. Absolutely. Muslims are walking, talking. Muslims are walking, talking paradoxical. Muslims are the most, most paradoxical creatures that you can find. And I have criticized a lot of um hindus in india who have said that let's boycott um some muslims uh, let's let's not buy uh, vegetables from the street vendor in um you know who's who happens to be a muslim etc and I, I have criticized that and again like you said any decent person would it's like why are you going after the livelihood of a of of a person who has not partaken in uh, any of this business boycotts uh, are uh, are not illegal in my view the, yeah, yeah, look you can but, but campaigning slope. it's a slippery but, slope but it's also campaigning against that because we know that there there's precedence for it this is exactly the kind of line of reasoning that was used by by nazi germany as well with the with, with jewish businesses so i'm saying as you said it's a slippery slope let's not go that far but again as i said everything is allowed to muslims everything is allowed and 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 the West or the Western leaders are so scared of that. I don't know if you follow the Swala Braverman story, what happened with her and how oh, she Oh yeah, did. yeah. Can, can you can you narrate what happened there? So so basically Swala Braverman has had a very firm stance against migration and she's made some statements. Um and again, like any decent person would, any person who loves his or her country would be concerned, to say the least, at least concerned about changing demographics and as a result. Uh, the impact is going to have on your socioeconomic fabric. Um, so she's been talking about this. And again, she did nothing wrong by saying that there's a two-tiered police system um, in, in, in Britain. Uh, one set of standards for, for, for right-wing. She used the word right-wing. She didn't even say conservatives or patriots, as they would like to call themselves. She said there's one set of standards for them. And we saw that a couple of Saturdays ago. And then there's quite another set of standards for these pro-Palestinian protesters who are openly chanting, who are desecrating British mon war memorials, um, who are chanting these uh, uh, genocidal slogans. There's quite another set of standards for them. And just because she said that, Rishi Sunak, who turned out to be as gutless and spineless as I, uh, as I could not have imagined, but he turned out like that. And he got under pressure. And he, again, it's appeasement policy. He appeased the other political party. He appeased the, 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 all, all these bleeding heart leftists and he sacked her. Um, so it, 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 
it's absolutely true there's a two-tier police system. Look at this. We have not seen any video like this where look at this guy. I'm gonna I'm gonna mute it. This guy, elderly British patriot who must have said something so horrible that the police decides to manhandle him. Um, and then you have these people who are being manhandled, beat, brutally being beaten up by the British police. And this British police that I've seen, I've seen them, they are, they're, they're such snowflakes. They actually don't do anything. But the heavy-handedness that they have shown to these British patriots by and large, mostly, again, I'm, I'm, I'm not being a party here, but by and large, on most account, they were peaceful. They were, they, were, they were not allowed an entry to the Cenotaph to pay respect to, uh, uh, to the British fallen heroes. And they, they barged in and they, they met some resistance from the Met Police. But then they went in and they had like two or three minutes silence, whatever is customary. I don't, I don't exactly know. Um, and they, every, every, the event, other than that, because the Met Police decided to block them. No, there was no threat from, from non-Palestinian pro protesters. There was no threat of desecration of the cenotaph. But the, uh, but, but, but the, but the British police, but the Met Police said that, oh, no, hang on, we're not going to allow anyone to go anywhere near it. And obviously they wanted to make a statement and they went there. So it, it clearly exposed this two-tier system. And Suella Braverman, Suella Brave Woman, she showed that she was, she was right. There was a two-tier police system. And that is, that is very, very problematic. If the West doesn't recognize this, uh, I, I worry that you're going to feed into, you're going to create more conservative people. We, we've seen that in Italy. Yes, I know that the, that, that the system is so strong that even the conservative people who come at the back of very strong anti-migration policies, when they come to power, like the, uh, like the Italian prime minister, she, she made tall claims. Uh, against illegal migration, but when she came to power, she didn't do anything. But what does that? Where does that leave all these angry people? They're gonna look for a more conservative or a or a more right wing politician next time round, and that's exactly what's going to keep happening. And these stupid blue haired, these bleeding heart idiots. I I just can't. We live in a world where this queers for Palestine. This this is literally the chickens for KFC. We literally live in the world of these people who who cannot, who have not read a single hadith on Islamic view or Hamas's view or the Taliban's view on uh, on queer LGBTQ people, but they are they, they are so engrossed in their own oppress oppressor mentality that they just cannot think think or see anything outside of the immediate box. They see white man is a problem. Therefore, anything that any enemy of, of the white man is my enemy. That's it. And what they don't understand that they are literally getting in the bed with the devil. Even Kushal, even five years ago, these people would they have just put it this way? I've used this analogy before. Five years ago, would these people have said queers LGBTQ for the Taliban because the Taliban were fighting um, mm. evil evil imperial Americans? Would they have said that if they had said that? Let's just say they had said that. If this wokeism was as bad as as it is now, five years ago, it was just as bad. If these people had said that five years ago, literally, they would have enabled the suffering of every every single woman, girl in, in Afghanistan, every single free-minded, liberal-minded uh, man, child in Afghanistan, and they would have contributed to that directly. And this is exactly what they're doing. Talking about blue-eyed Idiotic liberals. I think nobody. Uh, yeah, uh, I think uh, nobody epitomizes uh, human stupidity in 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 the way Justin Trudeau does. I think mm -hmm. uh, you know when when they were distributing medals for human stupidity, I think Justin Trudeau was like, uh, "Hold my beer, uh, kind of like I'm going there. I need my medal, kind of a situation." And this is uh, this video was shared by Dave Rubin. Uh, which was basically rebel news. Uh, he cut two videos and made it. But this is actually quite kind of appropriate. So this is Justin Trudeau when he was asked about these very violent sort of protests uh, which are happening 
uh, in favor of Palestine in Canada? And this is his answer. And then the next bit is when he was asked about the truckers' protest. So just look at this. Forgetting a little bit that we're a country that protects the freedom of expression, that protects uh, liberty of conscience. Trudeau invoking emergency powers, allowing the government to remove cars and trucks, suspend their insurance, and even freeze truckers' personal and corporate bank accounts. That respects and supports people even when we disagree with them uh, across various points of view. Small fringe minority of people who are on their way to Ottawa or who are uh, holding unacceptable uh, views uh, that they're expressing. We're a place that does diversity better than just about anywhere else. <laughs> so this guy, he epitomizes uh, human stupidity on steroids, I believe. Yeah. I mean, if there is an on steroids version of human stupidity, it is Justin Trudeau. And the Islamists know that. And the Khalistanis know that for the record, because you can yeah. remove Islamism and you can add Khalistan and Justin Trudeau will give the same answer. Uh, Hindu temples get uh, vandalized in, 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 in Canada. No, no police investigation. Nothing is done. Everything remains the same. And you know what the interesting bit is? Uh, look at the speed of arrest. Look at the speed of the investigation and all these things that happen. And what do you think now now i want to focus on on a little bit different okay we've talked about islamism it's i just want i just want to add one more comment on that the, 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 these idiotic far leftists are the, the, they're like that woman who's just waiting who, who's just feeding the crocodiles hoping that she would be eaten last justin trudeau at the start of this conflict because again he you know there's a conundrum Ooh, who, sh who should we pick? The Jews or the Muslims? Muslims are far more numerous in number. And he went to a mosque and he was shouted at, cussed at. And uh, he had to run like a loser from one of these mosques. Um, so, yeah, uh, you're right. He epitomizes stupidity. It doesn't get any stupider yeah, than that. And you know what is unbelievable is that these people are not realizing what it's doing to Western society internally. It is clearly developing, and this is my biggest fear, and and people like you and I, like, I did not have to put up an act, and this is not the first time when I told you on WhatsApp that I don't want to create anti-Muslim content. This is not mm. the first time. I've told you but, this. But it doesn't I mean, matter. This, people are still going to call you an anti-Muslim bigot. Like they, they, they keep calling me that, oh, you want to see dead Palestinians. Like it's just, It just doesn't matter. There's no amount of reason. So if I can never please them, I'm, I'm just not going to try to. I'm, go I'm going to speak my mind. And, and I'm gonna and I'm gonna try my I'm gonna hope for the best. I'm gonna try my best to awaken the Western people, uh, but um, but yeah, it, it, some, sometimes it looks like you're fighting a losing battle. And and the problem is that these idiotic politicians on the left, whether we like it or not, and you have shared someone on the right with uh, Rishi Sunak. They don't what they don't understand is people are watching human beings are seeing what's happening in their countries, on their streets. Now, something that scared the living daylights out of me was this statistic that was shared on Twitter from a book. And uh, this one really share, uh, shared the shit, uh, scared the shit out of me where I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to show this about Sweden. And I'm not saying mm. it's just Islam or Islamism, but look at, read this section. Around 50% of rapes and attentive rates in Sweden are committed by foreign-born residents, most from countries with corresponding negative attitudes to gender equality and higher rates of female harassment than those found much in Europe. These trends for foreign-born crime more generally are also found in Norway, Denmark, Finland, and Switzerland. The interesting bit is this pattern is not unique to Europe. In Australia, for example, Sudanese migrants, many of whom experience high rates of violence in Sudan, are overrepresented in crime statistics, including violent crime. Now, why did I share this bit from the book? Why did I share this bit from the book? There's a reason for that. Because all of this is going to eventually have an impact on global immigration policies and how the politics of these societies are all intertwined with this thing that if we are not going to talk about this problem in a nuanced manner like someone like Harris and I try to you're going to have simplistic bigots talking about it who are going to generalize who are going to call all Muslims XYZ all immigration 
in a certain manner. What are you going to do then, Harris? No, no, or worse, Kushal. This is probably better of the two possibilities. The worse option is nothing's going to happen. Nobody's going to do anything and it's going to be business as usual and the demographics are going to keep shifting. And as we've seen, especially in the case of Britain, this, there's been a cover-up, there's been grooming gangs issue. Uh, the, and then the Home Office, I read the whole report, the Home Office tried to hide behind technical details that the majority were not, majority of the offenders were not Muslims or Asians, they were they were white people. And in some cases, in some police stations, there was an error in data collection. One of the technical flaws was the fact that you are legally supposed to get a person's ethnicity from his own mouth. In some cases, they looked at me and they said, okay, he's, an, he's a brown Asian man. And they probably judged it from my name, Harris Sultan. Okay, probably a Pakistani. And they put it down. So they discarded that information. I read the whole report. And when you put that all into equation, into sorry, when you put all of that into consideration, you realize Muslim men, particularly from our part of the world, my country, were overly represented. And this is exactly the fact that Swala Braverman highlighted. And they went after her. That was her first strike. People, they attacked her, all the, the, the this freaking leftist mob they attacked her that but she said she, she survived that but you know one strike is one strike and then there's another one and then another one and that's it and then they took her out so you're saying that they're gonna be some bigots who are gonna generalize all muslims yeah okay that shouldn't happen what we're proposing is the best case scenario talk about it honestly look into these pro problems genuinely and try to come up with solutions but nobody's paying attention that goes out the window the second one, you're saying that that's going to be the outcome because people are going to take matters into their own hands. We're going to have a lot of angry people who are not going to be happy with the immigration policies and their politicians. That's a, that's the second option. But the third option is, which I am beginning to believe, it's going to be no action, business as usual. Uh, Muslims in 2003, 4% of the British population were Muslim. Today, they're 9%. Uh, and none of the... Ten, uh, in another 10 years' time, that number could be 15%. I'm sorry, you've seen this already, that when Muslims are pissed off about some far-flung political issue like Israel-Palestine, they can gather nearly half a million people in front of the Big Ben. What are you going to do about this? The, the whole country is paralyzed. The police has given up. Um, and what are you going to do with 15% people? I can tell you one thing. Muslims unite like no other. This is the most cohesive group. The Westerners, you have this difference of opinion. Even in Israel, you have some Israelis who are against, who are demanding ceasefire, but there's no Muslim. I've seen, I've seen so many of them. I would say 90% of them or over 90% of them. And again, we see who these influencers are, and Uteir or Muhammad Hijab, they, they don't even condemn Hamas for killing 1,200 people. They don't even condemn it. What do you think their followers are going to do? These guys have enormous pull. These guys have millions of followers who listen to them and they buy their narrative. And, and, and they're not some Pindus, villagers in Pakistan. These guys are living in the West. They live in London, America, Canada, Australia. These guys, these, and of course, they're going to parrot the same narrative and they're going to believe Hamas are freedom fighters. And the West is supporting them, whether that's Australia, Canada, Britain, or America. And they're going to see these countries as their enemies. They're, even Pakistani Muslims say that we are Muslims first and then we're Pakistanis. And I'm sure you have this problem too. As, a, as, as an Indian patriot, you, it, it pisses off a lot of Indians that why are you not loyal to your country? And again, Indian Muslims are native to India. Why do you think these people are not? I mean, these people are not even native to Europe or Britain. They're maybe second generation, third generation. They don't care about that. They have no, they owe no loyalty or allegiance to Britain. They might owe it if, Britain goes to war with Russia, let's just say. Might. They might. Um, although I've seen a lot of British Muslims who are supporting Russia just because Russia is fighting against the West. That's how much they hate the West. But they love living in the West. I'm sorry, I think the, the, the conservatives are allowed 
to ask these questions. They are allowed to demand their politicians to come up with a better solution. Otherwise, you're right. People are going to get more and more conservative. But we've seen, I, I, I see the far right in the West. I'm not downplaying their threat or I'm not downplaying uh, their, their hateful ideology. I'm talking about the far right wing white supremacists. But I think they're toothless. They've lost. They've lost it. They have no power. I think the West, uh, but Western men in general have been emasculated over the last 75 years or so. Uh, and, and these hypercharged, high testosterone Muslim men coming from Eastern countries, they've had tough lives. They, they, have, they have had violent upbringing. Again, I'm not talking about everyone, but this. A lot of them, a lot of them come there. We've seen hundreds of videos. Um, and, and this is the reason why you see these videos every single day. Uh, th these violent crimes are being committed against, you know, a, a peaceful, you know, like a metrosexual kind of a Western man getting beaten up by some, you know, by, by some really rough migrant who doesn't even speak the local language, but he beats the shit out of them. They harass Western women. I'm sorry. I, I think they're losing it. They're losing it. it. It's still not too late yet. But they have. I, I, I see no political will to come up with a solution. I see. I, I don't see any spine in these political in these spineless political leaders to do anything about um, the, uh, the, the, the about, about the migration crisis. Not only you already have a huge problem, homegrown problem of radical, ra radical Muslims within your own borders, but you are importing even more of them, the fresh ones. They're even worse than the homegrown ones. So what do you make of this news uh, clipping that was shared? Um... According to the New York Times, the current Republican frontrunner, former President Trump, plans to address immigration with mass deportations, detention camps, and a new Muslim ban if he is reelected. That's right, banning a religious group from coming to the United States. The Biden administration described Trump's reported plan as extreme, racist, and cruel. Now, this is a news report from MSNBC. I know that. This was a clipping from MSNBC. But I did hear Donald Trump say what he said. And it was not far off. Far off. Look, he said, look, he said it before. And, and again, the more desperate we get, the more desperate our measures have to be. Um and uh, he 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 tried to do that before. What is it? He put eleven countries Muslim travel ban or something. Yeah, but the no, coach, uh, coach removed it. They overturned And then the it. same thing happened. Swella so Braverman came up with this new immigration Rwanda plan. The Supreme Court threw it out. In Australia, we had some 40, 50 migrants with violent past. Hit. They had been in detention for quite some time. Which actually, I don't understand. Why don't you deport them? Why don't you send them back? There's no point in keeping them in detention camps for five, six, ten years. So in some cases, up to ten years. So the the Australian High Court said, "Sorry, you have to release them." Now these guys have proven criminal record, and you're going to release them on the streets of Australia. Um, so I don't know. I, I'm I'm not a law expert. I don't understand. I, I I I just can't understand how difficult it could be to vet people, ask them tough questions. They have already enacted laws where if you are found guilty of any terror-related offense, then your citizenship could be canceled. We have Shamima Begum's precedence, and I know it's difficult. I know it's, but at least it sends a good message. We have people like Muhammad Hijab with hundreds of followers walking in the streets of London asking for the blood of Jews, and nobody does anything. I, I, I don't know. I don't know what the solution is, but sh but I'm not willing to accept that there is no solution. We just got to take it. I just, I, I just don't, I, I, I can't I think, accept that. I think it's, uh, it's a policy problem and uh, I, I want to back you up. I think it's a larger left-wing mindset that is a problem here. I want to share something with you. I think you'll find it very interesting. This was before, before I share that with you. Before before you share that with me, I, I, I want to I want to give you a little snippet of what I'm actually talking sure. about. L listen to this. Sure, sure. Please do, please do. Okay, wait. I'll share. I feel so sorry for the Israeli yeah. Zionists. Why don't they give a place in Germany? Why don't they go to Hitler's back garden and make an occupation there? Then they will know what kind of people these are. Why every so many hundred years the Zionists get slaughtered because Hitler knew how to deal with these people. My goodness. They probably made a program so they can create a, a state of Israel oh my goodness. in the expense of 
Palestinian Muslims' blood. So the police was looking for him. Uh, again, I'm 100% certain they would have said, well, freedom of speech, let him have it. And uh, nothing would have done. Oh, my they, goodness. They would have done nothing about it. This is insanity. I did not know about this. <laughs> there, there, there's so many more. Uh, I, I could play. I've got tons of these videos where. Uh, they're, I mean, they're did, literally... you see, uh, did you hear what Susan uh, Sarandon, that famous uh, uh, Hollywood actor, she said? Did you hear her? I heard about it. She, so she said something pro Palestine and she got sacked from a movie. Is that is that the one you're talking about? Yeah. So she said something absolutely batshit crazy where something she said that uh, quote, uh, Jews are getting a taste of how it feels to be a Muslim in America. Huh? Uh, <laughs> I, I, I just don't get it. I, 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 don't, I don't get it. What the hell is wrong but, with these people? But, but to explain what, what's happening now, Harris. So it's a policy perspective. So read this article. I want you to understand what I'm trying to say. Prolific offenders are committing an outsized amount of crime in the province of British Columbia. This is again Canada. Now people might ask, Yar bhai, I live in Canada a lot now. So I follow Canadian news, Canadian policy, Canadian statistics a lot. So I just know a lot about that. So this is the news. Uh, where in February 2002, Hopkins was 36 and already had a lengthy criminal record fueled by addiction to heroin and cocaine. He begged the judge for a three-year prison sentence. Hopkins said he knew the system, knew the law, and knew, uh, quote, lousy, stinking 27 months wasn't enough for him to get the programs he needed to deal with the fact that he was, quote, very angry at the world. Quote, I want to deal with my anger issues. Those are things that I can't deal with in 27 months. The point is that in Canada, when they did some research, they found out there is a bare minimum number of people who keep committing the same crimes again and again. And these stupid Canadian courts and lawmakers have a system of keep releasing them back in society. And here, why did I read this? The criminal himself is saying, Oi, mad druggy, huh? I am a druggist. Take me back in. The criminal is begging. He's begging. Yeah. And they still don't get it. These are bad policies, Haris. That's what I'm trying to say. Yeah, but, but the West had this enlightenment way after the Second World War. The, the punishments kept getting lean, more and more lenient. Whereas uh, they made a mistake that people coming from other cultures where they have to go through you know a different sort of upbringing if you if you if you grow up in a slum in pakistan or even in india for that matter you've had a tough life you're not going to worry about a 3 month a, a 12 month good behavior bond over a you know like over doing something silly where, where you know like in our countries in india and pakistan you know like there's a lati charge there's a baton charge at the police and then they yeah, you know they they, they make yeah, they make they make you realize that. Whoa, whoa, whoa! You're never gonna do that again. I'm gonna. So we scare them. So we have harsher you see punishments. How th those videos about how our police used to deal with the uh, lockdown breakers. Yeah, yeah I saw that. It Many of them. I showed that. I showed them to a lot of my Western audience, and they were like horrified. Like even some people who say that <laughs> the punishment should be a bit more stricter than that. Even they were like horrified. They were like, "Whoa!" I'm like, "No, no, it's okay. It's okay." Even I'd get it. <laughs> <laughs> but 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 my, my point was the West is actually delusioned. They think that oh again these are I can I can I could understand that they're coming from a good position, but they are totally devoid of reality and understanding how the world actually works. You cannot and again like you talked about Sudanese migrants in Australia. Look, we had a sudden rise of violent crimes in Australia after a lot of Sudanese my refugees came here i'm not demonizing every sudanese of course but but they but but i remember listening to someone who was saying that these guys have literally seen like one of the worst kind of violence that you and i can't even imagine the family members getting butchered with hacksaw and uh, the, 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 with meat cleavers the limbs torn apart and then they come here and then, of course, it's going to be knife crime. Of course. And they haven't had, I don't know what kind of therapy they've had. I, that, that, that's going to take years of therapy for you, for them to assimilate in the in this peaceful, puppy-loving, tree-hugging kind of, a, you know, Western world. So, 
a lot of that is self-inflicted and europe i don't i don't know how often you go i go there every year but you, you, I, I miss the good days of europe <laughs> you know uh, and whether you go to france or you go to certain parts of england it's pretty bad australia is still the last bastion but unfortunately whatever happens in the rest of the world we get it a couple of years later so they need to make some tough decisions now now is the time so whether it's immigration so what kind of immigration because see how is trying to understand this point of view then if they make an immigration policy about muslims in general then won't people like you suffer let's say there are good people in pakistan so what do you do then so no so so obviously so australia has this luxury right so there are two types of migration obviously the skilled migrations i think indians are the biggest group of migrants That's into australia migrants not yeah. only in australia and canada not in, in, in I'm, i'm just let's, i'm just giving australia as an example so so i looked at it as there's china there's uh, vietnam there's some, obviously britain and new zealand and so many other countries but pakistan was there too but right at the end but they were all skilled migrants okay so the skilled migrants so that's the first step that we can hope Point okay system. we need skilled migration we need skilled migration people who who work hard for the migrant and and i know a lot of pakistanis in australia you know like a lot of them the 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 good people but the problem usually a big chunk of these people who who don't pay any respect are actually what we call boat people they they've just jumped on it again violent past they haven't like anything if you if you work hard for something like I worked hard I did my university degree and then I applied for uh, for for permanent residence and then I went through the process and they looked at my point system and then looked at everything and then I was awarded I was like thank goodness I got it I didn't want to go back to Pakistan so so I earned it right I worked hard for it um and then if you come there I'm not saying that you know it's all easy for migrants as well I think they go through a lot of hard work and detention I know some migrant people migrants as well um but you have to this this commitment that we have that anyone who comes here we we're, we're going to have to give them space or we we're, we're going to we owe them a life or livelihood in australia because one it undermine, undermines legal uh, migration because what about a good meaning pakistani who's done his university degree he's worked hard he's studied hard and now he wants to come what about him you or, or in india for for example you you've just taken his spot so so illegal migration boat people people coming in illegally there should be stricter uh, policies on them there aren't any secondly even i get it we have some geneva convention on international un human rights charter etc blah 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 human we we, we got to do that as well we can't turn back everyone um but there has to be a strong vetting process there are, you think in this the world that we live in where we don't even look at someone we don't even make a comment about hijab because it's politically incorrect you think they ask these tough questions to these people ask them I'm I'm sitting in the migration office. I asked this guy, yeah, fighting age, 25 year old male, no woman. All of these guys coming from these so-called dangerous places. Why have you left your family behind? Okay, all right. Ask some tough questions. What do you believe in? Do you think this is okay? Do you think this is okay? I know they can lie. They can do takia, whatever. They can lie, but don't give them permanent residency. Have them on good behavior bond. Have had them in these places again only if your economy can support them right now we we have a mockery of the system there are people found living in british hotels where they're paying 60 50 pounds a day to these people while ordinary people um, are struggling to make ends meet so you can only take as much as you can okay and again make like this rwanda policy that swala braverman said i'm not a legal expert so i'm not going to say whether how humane or how technically legally it was apparently high court threw it out but i know that in australia our liberal party which is the center of the right party they always come back with stronger migration policies which amazingly it turns boat people away because these boat people are not coming on their own like i mean they're, they're coming here through people smugglers and people smugglers know which country is the best one to go to where your chances to get the local citizenship are going to be uh, are going to be far better than going to let's say another country so so the liberal uh, 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 the, the liberals come here the liberal party comes here and they make such policies that turns away boat people and they go elsewhere they go to other countries and the labor party comes here and they say oh no you know we are more humane you know we got to look after everyone and then all of a sudden we start seeing more boats boats uh, turning up on our shores so 
it can be done. It can be minimized. But this currently that we see that these people full of boats, they just turn up on, on a Spanish beach. We've seen those videos on Italian beach. People turn up in hundreds and just scatter. They just go everywhere. They're, 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 they're those beautiful tourist Greek islands who have been just squatted by these thousands of migrants. And the police can't do anything because, again, the European Union I used to be a big fan of. But I think the system is broken because uh, Italy can't make any decision on, um, on on the migrant crisis without the approval from uh, Brussels. So, so it can be done. It just requires some political will. Yeah, in my opinion, I think it's uh, it's a much deeper question, which I can't uh, speak on in detail over here. I'm going to do a monologue on this. In fact, I'm going to do a monologue titled "All Cultures Are Not Equal." And oh, yeah. I think it's time. Uh, it's time to you know people uh, um, to understand this reality that different cultures have different values, different religions are uh, problematic in different ways, uh, and you have to respect that reality. Um, and uh, when you invite people into your society, it is very important to understand: do they carry your values or not? Because there are certain values that make your society click and success, succeed. Those, uh, those, uh, those values could be freedom of speech, individualism, uh, human, the concept of human rights, concept of law and order, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And when you have people who come in who may not have these values, you're going to deteriorate your society collectively. Now, as of now, the West was successfully able to manage where the first generation immigrant, most of them were educated, so it was fine. And then their kids were just born in those countries and they became like that country. But now they are facing this problem. And, and again, there is radicalization through the internet, which just cannot be stopped. The internet is, while the internet is also opening people's minds, right? When people like you and I have conversations, there are young people, people or middle-aged people or old people who listen to us and they are, their mind is also open to liberal values to, to in my case, a, a mix of Eastern and Western values, both. I, I am a mixture of both cultures. And I always say this, that uh, it, it's a battle of ideas. Everybody has to do it. And uh, if we don't uh, unabashedly call, uh, this is why I have such a huge problem with moral relativists, whether in India or whether outside India, you know, inside the Hindu community, there might be people who always come up with some sort of absurd apology uh, every time some aspect of Hinduism is, uh, you know, criticized, calling it some colonial this, colonial that, this, that. I'm like, look, everything cannot be a colonial conspiracy. Uh, maybe hmm. your culture has some sucky values and you should understand that and try to improve it. Like I've always said, uh, Indian culture overall is better than Pakistani culture. I, I, you're a Pakistani I'm, and, 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 and I'm saying this very openly. I believe Indian culture overall is superior. India carries certain values and, and even Hindu culture carries certain values that are better than Muslim values. Similarly, Western culture is superior. Whether you like it or not, it is a superior hmm. culture. And, and, uh, I don't know how else to say this, and immigration policies have to be designed around that. Yeah, but then I was going to uh, probably the UAE is not the best example, but I think we can learn something from there as we play, we started this stream with the uh, UAE's foreign minister's statement. A lot of these people go there. What is it, 60% or 70% of the UAE population is foreign born? They're not even uh, something like that, but Indians. Uh, yeah, well, they're not all Indians, of course. They're, they're, a, a lot a of lot, them huge are. chunk oh, yeah, of them know, are I Indians. I know, I know. But my point is, people people from all over the world go there, tax-free haven, you know. Yeah, but really strict laws. And I hope that they actually, obviously not every law, I don't agree with every law, because there are a lot of Islamist laws there too. Oh, they There's have ridiculous laws, man. Yeah, yeah no, 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 but they, look, they have religion. softening. Look, they have softening them. Like, for example, they've legalized... Uh, adultery, so you know, or decriminalized. Sorry, they, they have decriminalized adultery, and I think um, we're probably going to see decriminalized homosexuality as well. So those humanist laws, but they they are very harsh on violent crimes, and yeah, nobody cross nobody crosses the line there. So, but we have, as you said earlier, these heroin addicts, these junkies, they're doing violent crimes, stabbing, etc. They go they go in front of a, they appear before a Western judge. He gives them about six months. The first offense, twelve months, good behavior bond. No, I think so. Yeah, the West. Yeah, the West has been a superior civilization for, especially after the Second World War. Um, but 
I don't know, some of his strengths are becoming his weaknesses. And a lot of people draw analogies uh, or parallels between the Ro the ancient Roman Empire and uh, modern America or the West in general. And if you look at one of the many reasons of the fall of um, the Roman Empire is attributed to, um, you know, this refugee crisis. There were Goths coming in from all directions. There was the, 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 there were Huns coming in from the other direction. There were, there, there were migrants coming from all around, and the empire was in was unable to house them or even to repel them. And in the end, the Roman army, the majority of Roman army, was consisted of these um, these other nationalities. Um, so I don't know. I think the history has a funny way of repeating itself. Yeah. So just for context, for people who may not know, so 3.16% of Australia is Muslim. In the case of New Zealand, is 0.84%. Then you have the United Kingdom. It is 3.23%. That's it. That's, but... No, no, it's more than that. No, it's more than that. I'm, it's close to 8%. You sure? Yeah. You sure? Pretty, pretty sure, yeah. I think you're looking at old oh. numbers, bro. Yeah, so there, there was a there was a census result too. Um, no, it's three point three percent. I'm looking at world population review, and I'm I'm talking about United Kingdom. World population see. review, and uh, maybe, maybe it's yeah. eight million then. Uh, six. No, hang on. So census yeah. result: British Muslim. Okay, so Muslim increased from four point nine percent. This is a census result from the government of U UK. Okay. Okay. In two in 2011, it increased to 6.5 percent, and I'm pretty sure right now it would be it's around 8 uh, percent. Sorry, 6.5 percent in 2021. So I'm at so, World Population Review. Yeah, that's just that's, yeah, it's, 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 it's just pathetic. It's obviously not up to date. As I said, so America the, the, is one percent. That's all America is at. Mm, mm. So it's four million, 6.5 percent, um, and that's uh, obviously. Uh, just uh, that's just actually England and Wales doesn't include Scotland, but I don't, I don't think it would be much. So what is Canada? Canada is around five percent. Mm -hmm. Okay, yeah, that, yeah, that sounds Canada. right. I have no idea about Germany and all those countries. I think Germany. I think is France also... is probably. I think France is probably eight percent, nine percent, nine percent. Okay, yeah, Germany yeah. is around five and a half percent, and then Sweden is around seven percent. I think. And uh, ten percent in twenty twenty three Islam in France. So, so isn't that interesting? I mean, if you look at it, a lot of people, and again, these bleeding heart left as they use the same argument. They're like, oh, it's only ten percent. I mean, ninety percent are non-Muslim, so it's not. It cannot be Muslims. Uh, but when you look at these individual uh, crime statistics, that disproportionately, disproportionately represented. Um, when you look at these political turmoils that you see, these protests, these th this clear clash of different set of values that each group espouses to or adheres to or follows, um, you you see that such a small number can cause such havoc. Then imagine no, but it's not be. all of them, right? It's a very tiny minority, but there's so how how tiny is it? No, no, I, 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 I don't even want to be politically correct, but how tiny no, no, is I, it when I'm half a million? Genuine. When half a million, okay, so, so when half a million Muslims turn up in London, right? Half a million out of 3.9 million, half a million turn up. So you could say, what, what is it? What, what does that work out to be? Half a million out of four, that's what 25 percent, 25 percent of Muslim population turns up in uh, pro-Palestine and they're all the same and again a lot of them didn't turn up I can guarantee you the vast majority of them would be pro and, and of course look out of half a million let's just say 100,000 were, were not Muslim they were just these bleeding heart leftists or something okay but these are the very passionate people who turned up my cousins who are very liberal kind of Muslims and I like they don't even care like I didn't even think I, I, I in my mind I thought they're probably atheists very passionate about Palestine and again, like I understand a lot of that. Is, it, sometimes it's it's just the in thing, and you just you're. It, it isn't an in thing. It's a hip. It's an it's a hip thing. But I think I'm gonna quote Tommy Robinson. He said, "What would you rather have me do? Hope for the best, or actually do something about it? Just hope, gamble, gamble with my future. That oh, you know what? They're they're, they're gonna they're gonna come around. They're not gonna do anything. Or I need to force my government right now to take decisions that is going to soften the blow." 
in the future. So, I mean, if I was Tommy Robinson, yeah, I'd be, I'd be on his own. I'm not, not even Tommy Robinson. I'm not even, a, I'm not even white, but I can see the threat. This, this is a genuine threat. Anyone who doesn't acknowledge it is literally sinking his head in the sand. Yeah. Okay. Let's now take the questions and then we'll uh, yeah, wrap it get up. out of here. So do you take, this is from your channel. Do you guys think correct ep epistemology is a proper weapon against these issues? Otherwise it leads to what about re regarding different religions? It's a very good question. When is it? Yeah, do you want to take it? Do you want to answer it? No, I think correct epistemology is very important, which is why I decided uh, along with Harris to call it Islamism, not Islam. Although I'm not a fan of religion <laughs> at a personal level, but I still believe that the problem is Islamism. Now, Harris might disagree with me. It's okay. Uh, 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 yeah, <laughs> but uh, I think it's an uh, it's it's when you use religion and uh, in a in a political way, that's when the problem survives arrives. Because otherwise, uh, Christianity is equally problematic at a textual level. It's just that people don't take it seriously. That's the only difference between the two. The level of religiosity. Now, that that's that's why I think it's very important to use these things. And second... No, is but in that, that case... Oh, sorry, sorry, uh, go on. Sorry, I, I thought you were done. And the second case is that just like an Islamist is driven to impose Islamism on your society, you have to be driven to impose liberalism on uh, on your society. When you are driven is when you fight for your rights. You should have that zeal for democracy, for liberalism, for free speech. Yeah, look, I, I obviously disagree with that because what does Islamism mean? Applying Islam. That's what it means. And those who are not Islamist, basically, they're the one, they're your modern Christians who are not taking Islam seriously. So Islamism is a problem. Why not call Islam a problem? Islam is a problem. Christianity we would all be concerned about Christianity if, if Christians started taking Christianity seriously. Although I doubt that Christianity has a potential of being that lethal, as lethal as Islam. Has anyone ever wondered, why do Muslims, you know, are, are a special case? Why, are, why do Muslims take Islam more seriously than any other group of people? I mean, in, you see a lot of Hindus, they, you know, they have this reverence to their religion and uh, but but mostly is benign and and pacifist and as you know they're just interested in their worshiping and you know the festivals and puja part and all that kind of thing which I might find stupid but it's not lethal it's not dangerous I don't mind I don't care about that but Islam every Muslim moderate or not lipstick or not ends up becoming an Islamist and the litmus test comes when there is a conflict again Israel Palestine. Straight away, even if the West, the West has a, the West has its own baggage. It's not as simple as like, oh, there's some Bible thumping uh, Christians who support Israel Zionist movement, and that's the reason why the West stands with them. Rishi Sunak is not a Bible thumping, uh, you know, uh, uh, pro-Zionist Christian. He's not. Israel is the only democracy in the Middle East. Is is the only true democracy. Yes, it's not perfect. By any stretch of imagination. Israeli Muslims have more rights than Palestinian Muslims. Or, or no, I heard a better one uh, than any other Muslim in the Middle East. How many other mu Middle Eastern Muslims actually vote and elect their leader? How many? Yeah. None. None. So, um, so yeah, so, so, so that's the reason why. The reason why the West is standing with Ukraine is because Ukraine is a democracy. The West goes to defend democracies. People don't understand that. Even the people who grew up in the West, they don't understand that. They think that oh, some conspiracy, anti-Islam, anti-Putin, anti-Russia. They, they have imperial America. They have their own ambitions, the oil. Yes, it can be all of those things as well. Some people say, well, you, the, the West only stands with Ukraine because they're blonde-haired and blue-eyed Europeans. That's why they're standing. Well, you know, you know, it's the easiest counter to that is Biden has said numerous times that if, if China goes into Taiwan, we're going to go for them. E even though historically America's policy has been that of ambiguity. Uh, leave them guessing. China knows, yeah, would they come? Would they not come for them? Well, the Taiwanese are not blue-haired white Europeans, but the America would go from America would go for them. You know why? Because it's supposed to be a democracy. We have a we have an obligation to protect and defend democracies. South Korea, if anything happens to it, we'll go for them. So um, so, so that's what the West does, and unfortunately, it is in direct conflict with Islam, which leads to Islamism. 
Yeah, but religions are uh, developing at different rates. Uh, the older the religion, the less uh, potent it becomes over a period of time. I don't have two hundred years to find out. <laughs> I saw my mallow down in the twenty third century. Oh, okay, I don't have that much. I don't have that much time. <laughs> all right, all right. Let's go to the next question. Kushal and Harris, your thoughts about Professor Hood Boy's comment? I mean, we can't read the clip, so. I don't know, yar. What we can do is we can read this and I'll probably leave a comment or something. Okay, I request both of you to always keep a disclaimer when you are talking about religious dogmas that ideologies and humans are different because some viewers are not able to differentiate between the two. I mean, how many times are we supposed to give this disclaimer? I'm bored of this disclaimer. Every time I give the disclaimer. I was going to say that, you know, the West has actually fallen in this rabbit hole of oh, we have to respect religion when it should be the other way around. Muslims, are, we've said it 50 million times, Muslims are capable of changing their minds if we actually criticize Islam. But I see this Piers Morgan and all this, 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 this discourse in the West. Nobody has touched Islam. Nobody. They have gone after Hamas. They've, they've pointed out radical Muslims and they're wondering why these Muslims in the West chanting these genocidal slogans. But nobody dares in the mainstream, dares to question Islam. Where does that come from? Where does this mentality come from? Look at this guy. I have to play this video very quickly. I'm sorry. I wanted to play this before, but I'll play it now. Um, look at him. He says, this is not anti-Semitism. This is just a religion. Listen to this. But there will come a time, ya Muslim. There will come a time. And we relate the ahadith of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam that the Muslims and the Jews, they will fight. And there is coming a time where they will be fighting. And he told us, alayhi salatu wasalam, that the inanimate objects will speak on those days. The inanimate object will speak. And this is not anti-Semitic, this is a part of our tradition. We simply relay the hadith and we say that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam told us that when that is, there is a war going on. Mm. There's a war going on. And that, that gives them the biggest boner of all time. Like this in Islamic eschatology. <laughs> yes! <laughs> <laughs> that time will come and this is why Hamas gets and all the Muslims get so excited because they think yeah. now is the time now is the time maybe tomorrow that rock is going to tell me the stone is going to tell me that there is a Jew hiding behind him but anyway so he's saying look at this he's boastfully they saying they have it. drones that say to them oh so and so there's a Muslim there press your button and destroy it so we're simply just turning it around and telling them what our tradition will be at that time you have your inanimate drones that will speak to you and say to you, there's a Muslim there, doesn't matter that it's a hospital and there are dead people and there are injured people and old people. You know what we're going to do? Press a button and bomb it and there it goes. Just As like that. for the Muslims at that time, the okay. Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam told us that the trees and the stones, the stones will speak and say, oh Muslim, behind me there is a Yahudi, come and kill him. Yehudi means oh, Jew. Look, these times are coming. The way night follows day and day follows night because the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, wa sallam said it. So rest assured, I mean, just imagine how stupid these people are. You know, the, the West and the rest of the world. That, are... that piece of shit had a Western watch, a Western mic, a Western everything. <laughs> what the yeah, hell but, is but, he done? Yeah but, yeah, but listen to this, Kushal. How stupid are these people? There is one group of people, the West, that you hate the most. They're investing in drones, these inanimate objects who have actually made a reality that you know, like they can fly around and they can press a button and they can cause so much damage. Well, what are these guys relying on? One day that stone is going to talk to me. It's going to tell me there's a Yahudi Allah. He's standing behind me. Yeah, a Muslim come and kill it. You know? That's, so so I, I genuinely believe if Muslims are left to their devices in the Muslim countries, there would have never been more than just a nuisance. You know, like you, by nuisance, I mean a terrorist attack here and there, frustrated attack, that would have been it. But that, but there can be more than that. But when the demographics change in the West, this can be really, really bad. It's not going to be like, oh, these are westernized Muslims. I hope that might be the case. I mean, I still am an optimistic person. I still hope that. But well, in America, uh, it is that case, right? American Muslims are very. You don't know Muslim. that, no. But we've seen, we've seen a lot. Yeah, look again. You, you, you probably, you, yeah, you give me hope. You're right that uh, there, there was some pro-Palestine um, uh, protest there as well. And look, they could be genuinely, they could genuinely think that this is 
a you know oppressor oppressor thing colonial versus uh, a, a, an oppressed group of people they could genuinely see that and they may not realize that at that at the heart of it it's a religious issue so once they understand that they might be able to go beyond that so so yeah you're probably right but uh, europe is very dangerously close to falling yeah well what do you do okay um somebody has asked walker i don't know where this from uh would you like to discuss aid groups actually helping palestinians if so how to contact um i think the general one would be the un the red one. cross the red yeah, cross yeah, i think the red cross is probably doing it i think so um but yeah i'm, I'm not i'm not fully aware i i i, I actually stopped watching i stopped following i, I haven't been tweeting on israel palestine palestinian issue because th- this is a common mistake that people make that just because you take a stance that is against the popular choice like you either on israel side or you on palestine side so if i say hamas is a terrorist organization what they did on 7th of october was evil and barbaric and israel has a right to exist and israel has a right to defend itself you go ah so you want to see dead babies no that's not what i'm saying it's my heart bleeds for them no 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 matter how many times you say it it doesn't matter you've picked a side you're you're a zionist you're on israel side even though i have throughout leading up to this point i have always spoken against the israeli jewish settlements um that are purely founded on islam and people who have listened to me for a very long time people who have followed me they have known this but even they're like no you're a zionist you're a uh, uh, you, well i do believe uh, israel, jews have a right uh, to a state um so th- i guess that makes me zionist but not that zionist that that, that is for uh, jewish settlements so so I, i i just thought you know i i don't agree with everything that israel does so I, i'm i'm trying to stay out of it uh, as much as i can so that's why like i mean and again with those videos that we see of um, of children being blown up um, it, it's very difficult uh, it's very difficult to to say but the good thing in that is that you could keep pressuring the israeli government that hey the world is watching you have to you have to try your absolute best to minimize it. and i think israel has has done a lot but again war is brutal and hor- horrific and ugly they have dropped flyers they have sent messages they've done they've they've done they've taken reasonable amount of steps i'm not i'm not an expert so i'm not going to say they've done absolute best or they they've done everything they could but i think they have done a lot to make to minimize the civilian casualties but at the end of the day 10000 people is still a lot of people but th- this is not a genocide as mohammed hijab himself has admitted this is not a genocide he said no i didn't call it a genocide so it's not a genocide but again muslims are good with using uh, these buzzwords the good yeah. in portraying themselves as the biggest victims of the world again palestinian people are right to have their grievances their right to protest their right to be angry um they are in the middle of a conflict again you all know what harari said it that people outside of this conflict people like you and me and people these muslim people and these christians and other people who are living outside of this immediate conflict we should not be such partisans we should not be just blindingly supporting everything or using the kind of language that ben shapiro has been using um so um, so yeah but it's messy so i'm i'm trying my best In to fact, stay out of it. i've hosted shadi hamid on my podcast there a while ago few months ago before before this uh, war started where i did share the palestinian perspective i would urge all of you to go and check out my podcast with shadi out and shadi i is someone i'm very fond of and i continue and i remain fond of him and he's very much on the palestinian point of view and he acknowledges hamas as a terror group too and he says what they did was wrong so the next question is i guess i'll have to take it how could india mm. deal with the menace of islamism when it comes to poor law enforcement should there be a civil society movement arpit uh, i disagree with you because there is no solution to uh, law and order law and order can only solve these problems and the good thing about india is that the police to citizen ratio in india while it is still less is actually improving and that's a uh, that's a thing that is something that is good and uh, i have data to back it up which i have shared many times in form of charts on this podcast so i can't uh, share it again uh, because otherwise i'll have to look it up again and uh, it's a whole uh, whole new process where uh, uh, basically what the chart shows is that communal riots in india year on year year on year uh, for a while 
have been actually going down consistently in india and that's only because law and order in india has been improving so i am we we can only discuss uh, post independence india i mean if somebody wants to get into this debate about what happened for 5000 years in india listen you can debate this with someone else but i'm not your person to debate that because i can only talk about uh, post independence india once the british have gone so again for the benefit of all the viewers uh, i'm going to put this chart up this is culled from the national database and these are the total cases registered under riots from 1970 to 2021 and uh, unfortunately for the audio members you cannot see this uh, audio listeners but as you see on the screen the numbers have nose dived because state capacity in india is consistently getting better and that's the only solution to this problem and i don't know why people keep thinking civil society or any this movement um any other kind of movement will help this it doesn't actually so this gentleman forgot to type the question uh, so i don't know <laughs> what do i do with the person take it we we'll take it yeah so i don't know what to do i mean the, they should have typed the question uh, is this a super sticker it's just a super yeah, so, sticker some people just like no, to no, I, shower yeah, you with okay. money yeah israel palestine two state solution works only but if palestine is a secular democracy and that is a tragedy cause the palestinian answer is a caliphate what do you make of that yeah in an ideal world yes but that you, but you can't keep on going like this and you can't keep on saying well you're going you're not going to form a kind of government that we want yes we know islam is bad we know islamism is bad jihadism is bad and caliphate idea is a is a medieval idea we know all of that and i get it that israel um is concerned and they would rather keep the palestinian territories occupied um and say that well we're going to keep this uh, you know blockade on these palestinian territories to make sure that you don't get any weapons to um you know to attack us with so i get that but things can't keep on going the way they have been going so i, I was listening to someone uh, on times radio and they were saying that the that, that the biden administration must be having some sort of an end game or 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 a, or a plan post conflict where they'll have to do something but israel currently saying well we're going to occupy it we're going to run it ourselves but i think that's only going to make matters worse I mean I guess you could probably do it on temporary basis for 5 6 months or 6 months or maybe 12 months but then you're going to have to involve some other muslim countries as well you're going to have to say well you know we can't let it happen we can't let it be a breeding ground for another hamas like organization uh, which is 5 years down the track they're going to kill 1200 of our civilians again we can't allow that so so there has to be a better solution uh, you you have to find moderate voices from within the muslim world I think there was a hope that Israel was going to reach some sort of a some sort of an agreement with Saudi Arabia and Israel uh, and Iran sabotaged it it's clear as daylight anyone who doesn't believe it is an idiot Hamas is a is an extremist organization that wants to wipe Israel off the map no sane voice can accept that or no sane voice can sit on the table with those people um so the need to find and Benjamin Netanyahu has to go as well Benjamin Netanyahu is on record saying that you know Hamas works out better for us better for Israel because these rat the more I'm paraphrasing of course or I'm just explaining what he meant that the more Hamas acts out the better it is because then the world will be focused on that and then hey we don't we can't have a two state solution look at this so moderate voices from within Palestine have to be empowered Bibi Netanyahu has to go and we have to eventually move towards a two state solution by the way as much as i've done my reading and i've listened to experts as well uh, i know it's all, all, all version of events are contentious but israel has been more serious about a two state solution on more instances than the palestinians uh, because it's all or nothing for, uh, for for the palestinians and it helps them theologically as well we take it otherwise we keep producing martyrs we we love death you know like people like muhammad yab they 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 popularize these kind of beliefs so we we love to die while he says it he says it from the comfort of his um from his british home where he gets like what 25 30 million youtube views a month that amounts to somewhere around 40 50 000 pounds a month that's some that's a lucrative business and he's enjoying his way um his fame and notoriety but at the same time 
He wouldn't go, but he would tell other people to go and die, fight for the Holy Land. One rules for me, one rules for thee. Yeah, exactly. So, okay, this is, uh, there are two questions. I'm going to mix them while I put one on the screen. Will all going immigration to the West increase racism? Basically, what the, what the other person had said was Muslims in Europe will basically immigrate. And if they, if the Islamists keep on their activities, then there will be a giant backlash in the form of racism and violence. That's what people are saying, which is something which is sad because, listen, just like for us, uh, Haris, everybody knows that. First, I'll say this in Punjabi Hindi. Sare gore eko jai lagdene sanu. Like all white people look the same for us. Onanu vi sare eko jai lagdene. So then for them also, all brown there are people some are prettier. The there are some prettier ones. And then there's some ones. <laughs> So no, so so what well, Krishna was saying obviously like they may also see all of us as the same. So so yeah, look, I mean the white supremacists might think that way, um, but as I said, the white supremacists have lost the battle. They have. They, 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 there's they they call s s slightly conservative people like Tommy Robinson far right, far right, far right, and we've seen that they're, 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 they're harmless. They could not. They could not do anything, even on the Remembrance Day. When and I think only Tommy Robinson could do it. But they, what are you going to do when the hundred Tommy Robinson, influential ones or charismatic ones, who can mm -hmm. gather crowds? That 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 obviously certainly is a possibility. But I have a feeling that they're sleepwalking into it. The West is too. It's become too benign and toothless for. For, for for his people to do anything like I don't know who said it, but the Western men are emasculated. They they they, they have been. Um, I don't know. I I I I, don't, I I think if we we might and we might need people like Swella Braverman or those kind of politicians. Um, we can we can bet our hopes on them. But even then, like the system is the system is too strong. It's too humane. It's too humanistic. As I said, even if you make some laws or you make some legal changes, the, the Supreme, the, the courts might overthrow it, like the Trump's Muslim travel ban. He might say it. He might win elections on that promise, but he would never be able to implement that. Yeah, I guess it will take the LGBTs uh, to go to Gaza and to the rest of the Muslim <laughs> world and change them. Yeah, I think that's what we need to do. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah the LGBTs for Gaza. Anyways, so we'll wrap we'll it buy up a return now. We'll buy a return ticket, but they might but they might not need yeah so yeah before we wrap it up i'll give you the last word i think i've said way too much i think we've we've, we've spoken enough i think it's uh, it is high time that the western leaders wake up i i have been thinking that what we've been saying for a very long time that the the threat of islamism is coming this is creeping sharia this the, the numbers are increasing and hoping that they will change, they will abandon their belief without us targeting Islam. Islam is the root of all evil. Muslims say that, oh, I, a Muslim could be wrong, but Islam is perfect. We have to reverse the narrative. And in the, in the main discourse, people are still reluctant to criticize Islam because it's a brown man's religion. And Muslims also tend to react very violently. And any person from uh, from the native side uh, be it Americans or not Native Americans, but I mean Anglo-Saxon people. If they if they try to the local inhabitants, if they try to criticize Islam, they become far right wing white supremacist bigots. We have to drop this attitude. I'm 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 willing to show more compassion to not willing. I mean we've always said it that because I and people like me are the prime examples of change. We can assimilate, but only if we are allowed to have an honest conversation islam is a religion an ideology like any other ideology it can be attacked can be criticized on mainstream we can target it um we should not queeze and cringe and uh, you know say that oh it's inappropriate for us to talk about prophet muhammad's marriage of nine years old well what, what, what's the west going to do like these bleeding heart leftists what are they going to do when they say well i should be allowed to marry a nine-year-old because it's my religious right Sunnah, which is following in the footsteps of the Prophet, is a major tenet of Islam, Islamic faith. Are you going to say, well, okay, you know what? Because we're polite, we let you block streets and pray and uh, be annoying for everyone else. We let you uh, blare out your azan, the call to prayer, on loudspeakers now. We don't care about the neighborhood. 
we are bending over backwards. Okay, maybe let us bend over backwards a little bit more for you and allow you. We let you be cruel to animals and have halal food. Um, but, you know, where's it going to end? You have to grow a spine. You have to be able to attack Islam, criticize Islam, exactly the same. This is not a special privilege. Exactly the same way you attack and criticize Christianity. You've allowed that. Why can you not allow that to Islam? That has to happen on the mainstream. In my opinion, it's not as simple as that. I think human beings are complex people. Uh, what, what needs to be done is the West needs to be more assertive about its... Uh, uh, ideology about its principles. Um, you can be kind while being assertive about your own ideology, about your own principles. And I think what the West needs to do is being unapologetic about their ideology, their way of living, their culture. And once you are unapologetic and idea and 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 unabashed about your way of living in your life, I think things will fall into place. I I already see that because I travel so much now. When I'm in the West, I, I drive more than 10,000, 12,000 kilometers, right? I, I meet people, I do talks, I go around. It's not just Indians, right? I meet other people too, other races too. And, and there is a clear-cut awakening inside the West, not just about the issue of Islamism. Uh, by the way, Justin Trudeau did the best service uh, by uh, the entire India-Canada fiasco. And now there is awareness about Khalistan in Canada. You know, a lot of my white friends did not know Khalistan. Only after Justin Trudeau messed up, did they they went and searched. And they're mm. like, oh, these people are crazy. <laughs> mm. We're not on their yeah. team. We're not on their yeah. team. So people uh, do uh, do realize. I, I, I think I see that in India too. I see state capacity increasing and India becoming better for law and order. Because people don't realize it's only when you have law and order is when you have economic growth. They're actually intertwined with each other. You cannot have economic growth without law and order. That's that's a prerequisite condition. I think uh, there is hope. I think we need to be more unabashed when we have discussions like this. I think good, good Muslims also need to speak up. I think ex-Muslims should also speak up like you do. And, you know, people from different faiths, Christian faiths, or people from my background, you know, disbelieving Hindus or stuff like that. We should all speak up and uh, uh, and let the chips fall where they fall. I, I, I think this is a battle that's going to be won by the liberal side, not by the Islamists, in my opinion. I'm actually very positive about it. At least in India, it's clearly the Islamists are losing. It's very clear. In India, Islamists are losing. They, they, they are becoming weaker by the day. And I don't see any reason why it will not happen in the West. And the population of Muslims in India is far more than in the West. But it's still in India. They're able to manage it because they do certain things right. And that that's about it. The West has to do those things right. But hey, we'll we'll close it over here. And Harish, it was a, it was a pleasure talking to you as always. Thanks. And uh, take care. So guys, before we wrap it up, once again, in the description of the podcast, I have left the links to Harris's YouTube channels, both the Urdu one and the English one. So please go and uh, subscribe to his channel. You can also follow him on Twitter or X, whatever you guys want to call it. He also has a Patreon. So if you want to go and support Harris, you can go and support him on Patreon too. Uh, I would uh, I would uh, recommend that too. Also buy my and, book. Yeah, you can buy Harris's book too. The link is there on his Twitter description also. I think yeah. uh, on the Twitter description, you can go and buy his book too. And as far as I'm concerned, you know, I don't do any ad reads on this podcast, although I get offers. So if you can, please support the membership program of the Charvak podcast, whether by joining it on YouTube or on Patreon or on Fanmo for Indians. Uh, and uh, if you can't do that, you can send your donations to UPI. You can also buy the Charvak podcast merchandise on kushalmera.com or on Kadak Merch. And if you can't do any of this and you're just an audio listener, just leave a rating on Spotify, Google Podcasts you know, iTunes, or if you are on watching this on YouTube, subscribe to the channel, like this video. I'll see you guys next time. Until then, namaste, take care. Bye.